Section 67 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 48. Louis XIV. Literature and Art. Part 2. He was writing incessantly, all the while that he was preaching at Meaux and at Paris, making funeral orations over the Queen, Maria Theresa, over the Princess Palatine, Michael Le Tellier, and the Prince of Condé. The Edict of Nantes had just been revoked. Controversy with the Protestant ministers, headed by Claude and Jurieu, occupied a great space in the life of the Bishop of Meaux. He at that time wrote his Histoire des Variations, often unjust and violent, always able in its attacks upon the Reformation. He did not import any zeal into persecution, though all the while admitting unreservedly the doctrines universally propagated amongst Catholics. Quote, I declare, he wrote to M. de Baville, that I am and have always been of opinion, first, that princes may by penal laws constrain all heretics to conform to the profession and practices of the Catholic Church, secondly, that this doctrine ought to be held invariable in the Church, which has not only conformed to, but has even demanded similar ordinances from princes." He at the same time opposed the constraint put upon the new converts to oblige them to go to Mass, without requiring from them any other act of religion. Quote, when the emperors imposed a like obligation on the Donatists, he wrote to the bishop of Mirepoix, it was on the supposition that they were converted, or would be. But the heretics at the present time, who declare themselves by not fulfilling their Easter, or communicating, ought to be rather hindered from assisting at the mysteries that constrained thereto, and the more so in that it appears to be a consequence thereof to constrain them likewise to fulfil their Easter, which is expressly to give occasion for frightful sacrilege. They might be constrained to undergo instruction, but so far as I can learn, that would hardly advance matters, and I think that we must be reduced to three things. One is to oblige them to send their children to the schools, or in default, to find means of taking them out of their hands. Another is to be firm as regards marriages, and the last is to take great pains to become privately acquainted with those of whom there are good hopes, and to procure for them solid instruction and veritable enlightenment. The rest must be left to time and to the grace of God. I know of nothing else. End quote. About the same time Fenelon engaged upon the missions in Poitou, being as much convinced as the Bishop of Meaux of a sovereign's rights over the conscience of the faithful, as well as of the terrible danger of hypocrisy, wrote to Bossuet, telling him that he had demanded the withdrawal of the troops in all the districts he was visiting. Quote, it is no light matter to change the sentiments of a whole people. What difficulty must the apostles have found in changing the face of the universe, overcoming all passions, and establishing a doctrine till then unheard of, seeing that we cannot persuade the ignorant by clear and express passages which they read every day in favour of the religion of their ancestors, and that the king's own authority stirs up every passion to render persuasion more easy for us. The remnants of this sect go on sinking, little by little, as regards all exterior observance, into a religious indifference which cannot but cause fear and trembling. If one wanted to make them abjure Christianity and follow the Koran, there would be nothing required but to show them the dragoons. Provided that they assemble by night, and withstand all instruction, they consider that they have done enough." Cardinal Noailles was of the same mind as Bossuet and Fenelon. Quote, the king will be pained to decide against your opinion as regards the new converts, says a letter to him from Madame de Maintenon. Meanwhile, the most general is to force them to attend at Mass. Your opinion seems to be a condemnation of all that has been hitherto done against these poor creatures. It is not pleasant to hark back so far, and it has always been supposed that in any case they must have a religion. End quote. In vain were liberty of conscience and its inviolable rights still misunderstood by the noblest spirits. The sincerity and high-mindedness of the great bishops instinctively revolted against the hypocrisy engendered of persecution. The tacit assuagement of the severities against the reformers between 1688 and 1700 was the fruit of the representations of Bossuet, Fenelon, and Cardinal Noailles. Madame de Maintenon wrote at that date to one of her relatives, quote, you are converted, do not meddle in the conversion of others. I confess to you that I do not like the idea of answering before God and the King for all those conversions." At the same time with the controversial treatises, the Elevation sur les Mystères and the Meditation sur l'Évangile were written at Meaux, drawing the bishop away to the serener regions of supreme faith. 
There might he have chanced to meet those reformers, as determined as he in the strife, as attached at bottom as he for life and death, to the mysteries and to the lights of a common hope. Quote, when God shall give us grace to enter paradise, St. Bernard used to say, we shall be above all astonished at not finding some of those whom we had thought to meet there, and at finding others whom we did not expect. End quote. Bossuet had a moment's glimpse of this higher truth. In concert with Leibniz, a great intellect of more range in knowledge and less steadfastness than he in religious faith, he tried to reconcile the Catholic and Protestant communions in one and the same creed. There were insurmountable difficulties on both sides. The attempt remained unsuccessful. The Bishop of Meaux had lately triumphed in the matter of quietism, breaking the ties of old friendship with Fenelon, and more concerned about defending sound doctrine in the Church than fearful of hurting his friend, who was sincere and modest in his relations with him, and humbly submissive to the decrees of the court of Rome. The Archbishop of Cambrai was in exile at his own diocese. Bossuet was ill at Meaux, still, however, at work, going deeper every day into that profound study of holy writ, and of the fathers of the church which shines forth in all his writings. He had stoned and suffered agonies, but would not permit an operation. On his deathbed, surrounded by his nephews and his vicars, he rejected with disdain all eulogies on his episcopal life. Quote, Speak to me of necessary truths, said he, preserving to the last the simplicity of a great and strong mind, accustomed to turn from appearances and secondary doctrines to embrace the mighty realities of time and of eternity. He died at Paris on the 12th of April, 1704, just when the troubles of the church were springing up again. Great was the consternation amongst the bishops of France, wont as they were to shape themselves by his counsels. Quote, Men were astounded at this mortal's mortality. End quote. Bossuet was seventy-three. A month later, on the 13th of May, Father Bourdaloue in his turn died, a model of close logic and moral austerity, with a stiff and manly eloquence, so impressed with the miserable insufficiency of human efforts, that he said as he was dying, quote, My God, I have wasted life, it is just that thou recall it. End quote. There remained only Fenelon in the first rank, which Massillon did not as yet dispute with him. Malbranche was living retired in his cell at the oratory, seldom speaking, writing his Recherches sur la Vérité, or Researches into Truth, and his Entretiens sur la Métaphysique, or Discourses on Metaphysics, bolder in thought than he was aware of or wished, sincere and natural in his meditations as well as in his style. In spite of Flechier's eloquence in certain funeral orations, posterity has decided against the modesty of the Archbishop of Cambrai, who said at the death of the Bishop of Nîmes in 1710, quote, We have lost our master. End quote. In his retirement or his exile, after Bossuet's death, it was around Fenelon that was concentrated all the lustre of the French episcopate, long since restored to the respect and admiration it deserved. Fenelon was born in Perigord, at the castle of Fenelon, on the 6th of August, 1651. Like Cardinal Retz, he belonged to an ancient and noble house, and was destined from his youth for the church. Brought up at the seminary of St. Sulpice, lately founded by M. Ollier, he for a short time conceived the idea of devoting himself to foreign missions. His weak health and his family's opposition turned him ere long from his purpose, but the preaching of the gospel amongst the heathen continued to have for him an attraction which is perfectly depicted in one of the rare sermons of his which have been preserved. He had held himself modestly aloof, occupied with confirming new Catholics in their conversion or with preaching to the Protestants of Poitou. He had written nothing but his Traité de l'Education des Filles, intended for the family of the Duke of Beauvilliers, and a book on the Ministère du Pasteur. He was in bad order with Arlet, Archbishop of Paris, who had said to him curtly one day, quote, You want to escape notice, Monsieur Abbé, and you will. End quote. Nevertheless, when Louis the Fourteenth chose the Duke of Beauvilliers as governor to his grandson, the Duke of Burgundy, the Duke at once called Fenelon, then thirty-eight years of age, to the important post of preceptor whereas the Grand Dauphin, endowed with ordinary intelligence, was indolent and feeble. His son was, in the same proportion, violent, fiery, indomitable. Quote, the Duke of Burgundy, says Saint-Simon, was a born demon, or naqui terrible, and in his early youth caused fear and trembling. Harsh, passionate, even to the last degree of rage against inanimate things, madly impetuous, unable to bear the least opposition, even from the hours and the elements, without flying into furies enough to make you fear that everything inside him would burst, obstinate to excess, passionately fond of all pleasures, of good living, of the chase madly, of music with a sort of transport, and of play, too, in which he could not bear to lose, often ferocious, naturally inclined to cruelty, savage in raillery, taking off absurdities with the patness which was killing, 
From the height of the clouds he regarded men as but atoms to whom he bore no resemblance, whoever they might be. Barely did the princes his brothers appear to him intermediary between himself and the human race, although there had always been an affectation of bringing them all three up in perfect equality. Wits, penetration, flashed from every part of him, even in his transports. His repartee were astounding. His replies always went to the point and deep down, even in his mad fits. He made child's play of the most abstract sciences. The extent and vivacity of his wits were prodigious, and hindered him from applying himself to one thing at a time, so far as to render him incapable of it." As a sincere Christian and a priest, Fenelon saw from the first that religion alone could triumph over this terrible nature. The Duke of Beauvilliers, as sincere and as Christianly as he, without much wits, modestly allowed himself to be led, all the motives that act most powerfully on a generous spirit, honour, confidence, fear and love of God, were employed one after the other to bring the prince into self-subjection. He was but eight years old, and Fenelon had been only a few months with him when the child put into his hands one day the following engagement. Quote, I promise M. l'abbé de Fenelon, on the honour of a prince, to do at once whatever he bids me, and to obey him the instant he orders me anything, and if I fail to, I will submit to any kind of punishment and disgrace. Done at Versailles, the 29th of November, 1689. Signed, Louis. End quote. The child, however, would forget himself, and relapse into his mad fits. When his preceptor was chiding him one day for a grave fault, he went so far as to say, quote, No, no, sir, I know who I am, and what you are. End quote. Fenelon made no reply. Coldly and gravely he allowed the day to close, and the night to pass without showing his pupil any sign of either resentment or affection. Next day the Duke of Burgundy was scarcely awake when his preceptor entered the room. Quote, I do not know, sir, said he, whether you remember what you said to me yesterday, that you know what you are and what I am. It is my duty to teach you that you do not know either one or the other. You fancy yourself, sir, to be more than I. Some lackeys, no doubt, have told you so, but I am not afraid to tell you, since you force me to it, that I am more than you. You have sense enough to understand that there is no question here of birth. You would consider anybody out of his wits who pretended to make a merit of it that the rain of heaven had fertilized his crops without moistening his neighbors. You would be no wiser if you were disposed to be vain of your birth, which adds nothing to your personal merit. You cannot doubt that I am above you in lights and knowledge. You know nothing but what I have taught you, and what I have taught you is nothing compared with what I might still teach you. As for authority, you have none over me, and I, on the contrary, have it fully and entirely over you." The King and Monseigneur have told you so often enough. You fancy, perhaps, that I think myself very fortunate to hold the office I discharge towards you. Disabuse yourself once more, sir. I only took it in order to obey the King, and give pleasure to Monseigneur, and not at all for the painful privilege of being your preceptor. And that you may have no doubt about it, I am going to take you to His Majesty, and beg him to get you another one, whose pains I hope may be more successful than mine." End quote. The Duke of Burgundy's passion was past, and he burst into sobs. Quote, "'Ah, sir,' he cried, "'I am in despair at what took place yesterday. If you speak to the king, you will lose me his affection. If you leave me, what will be thought of me? I promise you, I promise you, that you shall be satisfied with me. But promise me.'" Fenelon promised nothing. He remained, and the foundation of his authority was laid forever in the soul of his pupil. The young prince did not forget what he was, but he had felt the superiority of his master. Quote, I leave the Duke of Burgundy behind the door, he was accustomed to say, and with you I am only little Louis. End quote. God, at the same time with Fenelon, had taken possession of the Duke of Burgundy's soul. Quote, After his first communion, we saw disappearing little by little all the faults which in his infancy caused us great misgivings as to the future, writes Madame de Maintenon. His piety has caused such a metamorphosis that, from the passionate thing he was, he has become self-restrained, gentle, complacent. One would say that that was his character, and that virtue was natural to him. Quote, All his mad fits and spites yielded at the bare name of God, Fenelon used to say. One day, when he was in a very bad temper and wanted to hide in his passion what he had done in his disobedience, I pressed him to tell me the truth before God. Then he put himself into a great rage and bawled, Why ask me before God? Very well, then, as you ask me in what way, I cannot deny that I committed that fault. He was, as it were, beside himself with excess of rage, and yet religion had such dominion over him that it wrung from him so painful an avowal. Quote, from this abyss, writes the Duke of Saint-Simon, came forth a prince affable, gentle, humane, self-restrained, patient, modest, humble, and austere towards himself, wholly devoted to his obligations, and feeling them to be immense. 
He thought of nothing but combining the duties of a son and a subject with those to which he saw himself destined. End quote. Quote, from this abyss, end quote, came forth also a prince singularly well informed, fond of study, with a refined taste in literature, with a passion for science. For his instruction, Fenelon made use of the great works composed for his father's education by Bossuet, adding thereto writings more suitable for his age. For him he composed the Fable and the Dialogue des Morts, and a Histoire de Charlemagne, which has perished. In his stories, even those that were imaginary, he paid attention before everything to truth. Quote, Better leave a history in all its dryness than enliven it at the expense of truth, he would say. The suppleness and richness of his mind sufficed to save him from wearisomeness. The liveliness of his literary impressions communicated itself to his pupil. Quote, I have seen, says Fenelon in his letter to the French Academy, I have seen a young prince but eight years old overcome with grief at the sight of the peril of little Josh. I have seen him lose patience with the chief priest for concealing from Josh his name and his birth. I have seen him weeping bitterly as he listened to these verses, O miseram eridicen anima fugiente vocabat, eridicen toto ferebant flumine ripei. The soul and mind of Fenelon were sympathetic. Bossuet, in writing for the Grand Dauphin, was responsive to the requirements of his own mind, never to those of the boys with whose education he had been entrusted. Fenelon also wrote Télémaque, quote, It is a fabulous narrative, he himself says, in the form of an heroic poem, like Homer's or Virgil's, wherein I have set forth the principal actions that are meet for a prince whose birth points him out as destined to reign. I did it at a time when I was charmed with the marks of confidence and kindness showered upon me by the king. I must have been not only the most ungrateful, but the most insensate of men to have intended to put into it satirical and insolent portraits. I shrink from the bare idea of such a design. It is true that I have inserted in these adventures all the verities necessary for government, and all the defects that one can show in the exercise of sovereign power, but I have not stamped any of them with a peculiarity which would point to any portrait or caricature. The more the work is read, the more it will be seen that I wish to express everything without depicting anybody consecutively. It is, in fact, a narrative done in haste, in detached pieces and at different intervals. All I thought of was to amuse the Duke of Burgundy, and whilst amusing, to instruct him, without ever meaning to give the work to the public." Telemaque was published, without any author's name and by an indiscretion of the copyists, on the 6th of April, 1699. Fenelon was in exile at his diocese. Public rumour before long attributed the work to him. The Maxime des Saints had just been condemned. Telemaque was seized. The printers were punished. Some copies had escaped the police. The book was reprinted in Holland. All Europe read it, finding therein the allusions and undermeanings against which Fenelon defended himself. Louis the Fourteenth was more than ever angry with the archbishop. Quote, I cannot forgive M. de Cambrai for having composed the Telemaque, Madame de Maintenon would say. Fenelon's disgrace, begun by the Maxime des Saints touching absolute or pure love, was confirmed by his ideal picture of kingly power. Chimerical in his theories of government, high-flown in his pious doctrines, Fenelon, in the conduct of his life as well as in his practical directions to his friends, showed a wisdom, a prudence, a tact which singularly belied the free speculations of his mind or his heart. He preserved silence amid the commendations and criticisms of the Telemaque, quote, I have no need and no desire to change my position, he would say. I am beginning to be old, and I am infirm. There is no occasion for my friends to ever commit themselves, or to take any doubtful step on my account. I never sought out the court. I was sent for thither. I stayed there nearly ten years without obtruding myself, without taking a single step on my own behalf, without asking the smallest favour, without meddling in any matter, and confining myself to answering conscientiously in all matters about which I was spoken to. I was dismissed. All I have to do is to remain at peace in my own place. I doubt not that, besides the matter of my condemned work, the policy of Telemaque was employed against me upon the king's mind, but I must suffer and hold my tongue. End, quote. End of section 67